Oke, okay. can you see it now? Ya. Oke, okay. uh, selamat malam. Uh, good afternoon and also Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, to Yurian who already dedicated his time to prepare uh, setting of his knowledge and also experience working on bioacoustic. Uh, but before we start with the uh, lecture, I would like to first to share a bit about our lab uh, to those particularly who have never been in uh, Fakultas Kehutanan, Universitas uh, Gajah Mada. Uh, I would like to a bit share about what uh, is our lab and also what we are doing now uh, and yeah our lab is actually uh, called laboratorium pengelolaan satwa liar uh, we are in the faculty of forestry Universitas gajah mada uh, we have several uh, public information uh, such as in uh, instagram we uh, use vcc uh, as our account and then in in website we can find satwaliar.fkt.ukm.id or in Facebook we also have itu maksimal uh, suaranya known, uh, as wildlife conservation center and yeah just to give you a short uh, idea on uh, what we are doing uh, I will give you a very short in the uh, history and also our research interest and to give you some uh, information about our existing collaboration and also stuff. So at the beginning, we were not uh, as a wet lab uh, laboratory, but we call it as uh, Laboratorium Suaka Alam or uh, what do you call it? Nature Reserve Laboratory. And this is the picture of our uh, founder, uh, Professor Juan Tako. Uh, and since 2005 and until now, we have the name of the lab as a Laboratorium Pengelolaan Satwa Liar or Wet Lab uh, Management Laboratory. So we have various uh, name for the position of the head of the laboratorium from Professor Juan Toko, Professor Satyawan Bukit Moko, our college, uh, Pak Subeno, Pak Seno, and Sandy. And currently, I'm as the head of the laboratory. And yeah, in our faculty, we have a forest resource conservation department and our lab is part of the uh, forest resources uh, conservation department among other labs like forest ecology, water set management, nature uh, tourism laboratory, and also conservation area management laboratory. Yeah, this is uh, how we connect, yeah, uh, I think. Uh, this is our research interest. So our research interest is actually start from understanding uh, that uh, the change in our nature is uh, is uh, what do you call it? is uh, <clears throat> an uh, denied situation where particularly currently with the global change, uh, global climate change, and also other development change made uh, it is difficult uh, for us to understand whether the wildlife is uh, responding naturally or uh, it's respond as a expression of uh, adaptation. So our first uh, research interest is trying to understand the spawn mechanism of wildlife on the environmental change using uh, many different approach, like for example, using population, understanding population dynamic, behavior, genetic, and et cetera. And of course, because we are part of the faculty of forestry, we have been working on understanding the habitat key factor, which correspond to the mechanism of life response and adaptation. And also as a, our contribution for uh, practical work, we sometimes also need to develop environmental and also population manipulation to support adaptation uh, process of wetlands to environmental change. If 
it is necessarily uh, to be done. To make it short, this is uh, our uh, member of lab and including our laboratory room. And we have various uh, students and also research assistant working with us, including PhD student. Uh, I think we have more than this. I just only prepare for this. And yeah, we have been working also with many different uh, organizations, including uh, universities and also Ministry of Forestry, NGOs, both local and international NGO. We have been working a lot with them. And yeah. Of course, uh, while uh, we provide uh, research, we also sometimes provide a research grant as well as a scholarship for study, but of course, it is limited to some uh, part of it. And yeah, we do a lot of uh, training activities as well as uh, last year, we have uh, international symposium on wildlife biodiversity conservation. Uh, sorry, that was... Yeah, 2023, I forgot. And of course, last year with Yurian, I met Yurian in this international symposium on bioacoustic bio research. So, yeah, now it's time for Yurian to uh, share your knowledge and also your uh, experience working with bioacoustic. And the time is yours. Uh, you know, we are in Indonesia now, it's at uh, 20 and 10 so yeah. we expect that by 20, what, for 21 and 30 so jam setengah 10 yeah <laughs> we will stop uh, to uh, allow people to have a rest and preparing for the next ramadan uh, yes. fasting okay uh I'll stop now and i will let um, Julian to of course Julian, please introduce yourself as, as well yeah yeah. Uh, I will let you to introduce yourself. Okay, thanks, and the time is yours. Yeah, first and foremost, thank you so much, uh, Pam Muhammad Ali Imran, for this opportunity, and of course, the the initial opportunity to also conduct research in Indonesia. Um, yeah, this research is done in collaboration with UGM. Um, yeah, hello, Samwania, saya Yorian, saya dari Universitas Wageningen. Uh, hari ini saya akan memberi tahu tentang penelitian saya. I'm going to say it in English as I was asked to do it in English. So I hope that's okay for everyone. If you have questions, uh, feel free to say that in Bahasa. Uh, let me just share a screen. Yes, so today I'm going to be talking about acoustic conservation behavior from theory to practice. Um, I will be actually, the main idea is to share the research results that I conducted a research on gibbons. But um, yeah, I'm gonna give a small background into sound and animal communication. So the outline, a small background, I'll go into sound, vocalizations, vocal behavior, the conservation importance of vocal behavior. Uh, acoustic monitoring methods. I'll just like just briefly touch upon bioacoustics, spatially explicit capture recapture. I'll go into the conservation importance. I'll go into the challenges, and then I'll show a case study, and then I also have a short film on bioacoustic monitoring methods. So, uh, what is sound? Sound is basically a vibration. As you can see over here on the right side, you have a stick that beats a drum and it creates a vibration. Now what this vibration does is that it creates a pressure wave and this creates a vibration, but a vibration in motion in a medium. So this could be air, this could be water, or this could be solids. So what this looks like is, how does, it, how does sound travel? Is that you have vibration which is initially made by the stick hitting the drum, and that creates an energy of movement. This energy of movement is passed from one particle to the next in a medium, and this creates a wave of high pressure and low pressure. This high pressure and low pressure is because every medium has particles that are closely packed together and particles that are loosely packed together, and this creates compressions and rare refraction. And if you visually see this in three-dimensional space, it looks like a curve. And if you want a better idea, it looks more like this. 
And each wave or sound wave has three characteristics. It has the frequency, which you see, which is usually the Y axis on a graph. It has time, which is the X axis on the graph. And it has amplitude, which is then the third dimension. Um, yeah, so the human range is between 20 to 20,000 hertz. For then you have below 20,000 is infrasonic. That's basically the and the sounds that animals uh, animals make, such as elephants and whales, which we can't hear, but we can use equipment to hear it. And then you also have ultrasonic, which is above 20,000, for example, bats. So what are vocalizations? So vocalization is basically any sound that is actually produced or emitted by an animal. They are very diverse. For example, you see on the right side, you have many types of birds and they all have very different kinds of vocalizations. They may have similar characteristics, but they're not the same. So although the vocalization is very simple in definition, it's complex to understand because a vocalization is shaped and it's influenced by the environment. A bird that lives in an open landscape has a very different sound than a bird that lives in a closed landscape. A bird that is stressed produces a very different sound than a bird that is basically under threat. And that is also applicable for primates, for example, or mammals, but also different life stages. A young gibbon, for example, produces a very different frequency of sound than the mother, for example. Um, so what are some examples of simple and complex sounds? So the chirps of birds is a very simple sound. When a frog croaks, it's a very simple sound. When a wolf howls, it's a very simple sound. But you also have very complex sounds, which is like the great call of a gibbon, which I will show you in a bit. You have the rumble of elephants, which basically conveys much more information within the rumble. And you have this complex vocal repertoire of birds, for example, here. Maybe this in itself is simple, but the accumulation of different simple sounds can make a very complex sound. Now. Vocalization is one part in which be, in which animals can signal to each other, but there are also different ways. For example, you have visual cues. For example, fireflies, they actually flash their bioluminescence light to attract mates. And the, the higher the frequency they flash and lower frequency they flash tells something about how fit or how healthy is the firefly. But you also have population dances yeah. between birds, birds that dance to each other. No way. They show the different colors, which is also a visual signal. I'm just going to wait for that sound. Okay. Yeah. And then you have olfactory, which is basically um, yeah, signals that are communicated through smell. For example, rhinos, they urinate by spraying their urine across a very wide area or dogs to basically say that this is my territory. But you also have chemical behavioral signal, which is pheromones by moths to attract males. So as you can see, vocalization is this one way in which animals communicate with each other or signal to each other. Now, what is the conservation importance of vocal behavior? So although vocalizations is just a sound, but if you look beneath it, the sound is actually a mode of communication and it constitutes critical behaviors that influence reproduction and survival. I will go through some examples in a bit. But what are some of the examples that vocal behavior can help answer? For example, if you want to know what are the effects of anthropogenic disturbance on breeding success? If you put a recorder at a bird's in, in an habitat where there is in a, yeah, in a natural habitat and you put recorders in, in an urban area and you put them underneath bird nests, you can actually record how many vocalizations are coming from chicks. And this can give you an idea what is the breeding success differences between habitat types. But you can also know what habitat supports highest density of species? Does Diprocarp support a higher density of gibbons than lowland peat swamp forest, for example? But also, how does vocalization change in social groups? Do smaller groups, do they communicate differently with each other than larger groups? And what alarm calls signify danger? Does an alarm call that goes like, who signify that danger? Or does the alarm call signify danger. So it helps you understand how do animals actually signify, uh, communicate to each other danger. But, but vocal behavior can also give you very crucial metrics that conservation programs need to develop. For example, occupancy. Is the animal present or is the animal absent? Species richness, abundance, distribution, variability, 
habitat use patterns. So vocal behavior actually has a huge conservation importance. For example, over here, you have a sparrow. A sparrow has some very beautiful notes, as you can see, but the song in itself, what sounds to us is very simple, conveys a lot more information for bird species. So for birds, a song usually is important for mate attraction. So a female bird actually selects a male bird based on their sound. And this is called a sexual selection. But it's not just the sound that the bird looks at, but it looks at certain characteristics of sound. Is the sound complex? How quickly is the bird producing the sound? How many notes does the bird produce? How long does the bird sing? Because all these characteristics basically indicate to the female that the male bird is healthy and that the male bird is fit. But this also indicates that if the male bird is healthy and fit, it probably indicates that the habitat in which the male bird is living would be better for the breeding success of the babies. So for example, in the house sparrow, if you look at frequency and you look at the number of notes the bird produces, the relative proportion of that is what males listen, is what females listen to to select a male. So it's quite complex. And uh, there are studies that have actually shown this. But for example, sugar gliders in Australia, they actually eat the eggs of the parrot. So what the study did, it, they wanted to know, okay, how many parrot nests were actually were actually predated or occupied by sugar gliders, which is the predator. So what they did is that they played sounds of the owl, which basically predates the sugar glider and the sugar glider predates the parrot. And they said, okay, and they recorded how often or what was the frequency of response from sugar gliders to the owl's playback experiment. And in that way, they know what is the occupancy of predation. An example, elephants. Elephants, they produce simple sounds when they are in small groups, and then they produce clustered sounds when they're in more social groups and more larger social groups. So depending on how big the group is, elephants actually produce a different sound. And yeah, it's quite interesting that how this varies actually. So I'll now be talking about acoustic monitoring methods, and I'm mostly going into two types of methods, bioacoustics and spatially explicit capture recapture. So bioacoustics is basically the recording of sounds or the recording of songs, the recording of sounds to understand something about a species or a population. What are the advantages? The advantage is that larger areas can be surveyed within a shorter time frame and at lower costs. If you compare sound to a camera trap, camera trap can capture the presence of a species in front of the camera, but a sound you can hear from kilometers away. So a huge advantage is that you don't even need to see the animal. And the equipment is usually far cheaper than it is for many other survey techniques. Now, another advantage of bioacoustics is that it's actually behavior focused. What this means is that although there are many other survey techniques that are behavior focused, it bioacoustic primarily focuses on acoustic signals. So although you don't see an animal, which many other survey techniques rely on, such as line transects, and such as camera trapping, the acoustic signal from individuals and species can actually signify something far more important than just sight alone. And that's why bioacoustics is actually very important. So, and this is especially suited for species that make loud noises. So for example, gibbons, you can never see them. They're very rare to see. They live very high in the rainforest. They're extremely, therefore they're called cryptic species because you can hardly see them. And they're actually very difficult to survey and monitor. So therefore, Bioacoustic actually has a, has a huge conservation importance for species that are very hard to see. But also bioacoustics can help measure metrics. For example, for gibbons, you can understand which habitat they used. You can understand the density of gibbons. You can understand the abundance of gibbons, the population size, and even if hybridization is present. And this is what my case study will largely be going about. And lastly, Although there are so many advantages to the use of bioacoustics, it's unfortunate that bioacoustics is actually not a very commonly used technique. So how does active and passive bioacoustics work? So bioacoustics, which is just the recording of sound, you have two types. You have active, where you actually stand with your equipment and wherever the sound is coming from, you basically direct the equipment in the direction of the sound. But you also have passive, where like camera traps, you just put a bioacoustic monitor to the tree and it records everything that it hears. So in active, you record something specific that you want to listen to, 
Whereas in passive, you basically record everything that is basically heard in the vicinity. So for this monitor, for example, it was around three to 400 meters. Um, how does triangulation work? So this is a bit of a complex image, um, but triangulation is mostly used to infer spatial locations. And how it does this is that it uses three listening posts, post number one, post number two, and post number three. And what it and that's usually a third post is here. It's usually oriented in a triangle formation because from every listening post, you want to be able to hear the sound that occurs in the middle. So if you have a triangle, you want to hear the sound that occurs in the middle. So over here, you have a post over here, you have a post over here, and both of them need to be able to hear the sound in the middle. So therefore the distance between these two posts is not very large. And so what I did is that I, I took three types of data. I recorded the time of call when Gibbons was singing. I recorded the compass bearing or the direction as north, south, east, west, and I recorded the distance. And using these three characteristics from each listening post, you can actually plot on a map where the group, where the Gibbon group is actually located. And this is what you use for basically mapping Gibbon groups. And you can use Gibbon groups to estimate density, to estimate population size. But the main difference is over here is that you're using this to infer spatial locations from vocalizations. So what are basically the advantages of bioacoustics, biomonitoring techniques? To summarize, number one, it allows you to survey and monitor populations that are otherwise very difficult to survey and monitor. It can help understand critical be behaviors that species use to survive and reproduce. It's a gateway to infer conservation metrics just from sound, such as density, population, vocal behavior, genotype, hybridization, spatial use patterns. And it's especially crucial in areas that experience a rapid change in landscape. For example, Borneo, in the last two decades, there's been a lot of deforestation, but we're losing a lot of nature and species that we have no idea about. So bioacoustics is actually a very effective method to quickly survey an area just from sound alone. But what are some of the challenges of bioacoustics? There are two main challenges. Number one is that you, you collect large volumes of data and this takes a lot of time. I collected, for example, 180 gigabytes and it took me three months to basically go through just 100 gigabytes of data. So it is a very time consuming process. And if you want to try to automate um, bioacoustics, if you want to come up with machine learning algorithms, there are many challenges. You have challenges from the equipment itself. You have challenges from other species. You have the structure of vocalization varies. There's a lot of variability in structure within the species, within individuals, between species. But there's also a lot of vocal instability. For example, vocalization of a baby can change when it becomes an adult. And machine learning algorithms basically need to be able to understand all of this. So now I'll be talking about my research that I conducted together with Mohamed Ali Imran from UGM, uh, together with my two supervisors from Wageningen and um, two external supervisors, Susan Chain and Mark Harrison. The title of my research is Can Vocal Analysis of Song Structure? Vocal analysis of song structure can act as a robust monitoring tool for gibbon ecology and conservation. And I basically applied song structure to a natural hybrid zone. So you can see here that Borneo has four types of species or gibbon species. You have the Abots gibbon, you have the North Borneo gibbon, you have the White Bearded gibbon, and you have the Muller's gibbon. My research basically focused on this one and this one, and I was looking at this zone over here. So this zone is called a hybrid zone, and the the distributions of two species have actually overlapped. And under natural circumstances, so not because of fragmentation, not because of degradation, two, de two very different given species have come together to actually reproduce, to produce hybrid individuals. And I was interested to see, can given song structure, can, can that actually be used to basically help understand species composition and variability in a hybrid zone? So to understand where my research, what my research was talking about, I'm first going to briefly touch upon uh, what natural hybridization is. 
So natural hybridization is basically the mating between individuals from distinct lineages. For example, the two lineages over here were the Muller's gibbon and the white-bearded gibbon. They're two different species because they're genetically different. So this phenomena it created a lot of confusion in the past because before they thought a species can only mate with individuals of the same species. And it's and even currently, hybrids are not recognized as species. They're just recognized as hybrids. But genetic studies, and very recently, they actually showed that hybridization under natural circumstances is very common and can have a dramatic effect on speciation, adaptation, and genetic diversity. So there are two types of hybridizations. You have a hybridization that occurs under natural circumstances. That is when two species just come together and mate for no, for, yeah, we don't know why, but under evolutionary reasons. So just because it happens, but you also have anthropogenic hybridization where because of fragmentation and degradation, it pushes species to come closer and closer to each other and they almost get forced to mate with each other. And I will come back to that a bit later. Okay. Now, the, the interesting thing about hybridization is that across all primate lineages, such as lemurs, macaques, baboons, howlers, tamarins, gibbons, hybridization is present. And, hybrid, and, and the viability of hybrids, they can either have no difference in fitness, or they can be less fit than the parents, or they can actually show greater fitness to the parental species. And hybridization in the past in primates have resulted in new different morphological variations. So different color of fur, different color of skin, different color of hair. It has resulted in behavioral changes. So different song patterns, for example, or different uh, behaviors, so different spatial use patterns. It has also resulted in different life history and reproductive success. So maybe some of them was far better. They, they could produce a lot more kids than than the parent species, but it has also resulted in different vocal patterns, which is what my research is mostly focusing on. So just to briefly kind of give a bit of context to what hybridization is and how it can actually lead to new species. You have species A, which basically over evolutionary time, it gives you species B and species C. That is what usually happens in nature. And you also have the opposite. B and C could eventually disappear, or which is called extinction. But in hybridization, you have four different types of hybridization. So in the first type, you have species A that results in species B and species C. And these two species exist, but they also cross. They also produce hybrids, and the hybrids cross back with the parents. So you, have, you don't have a new species because the species is still mixing and mating with the parents, but you almost have this thing which they call as a hybrid zone. So you have hybrids, you have parent species B, and you have parent species C. What can also happen is that A gives B and C, but then B and C, they fuse together over time to give back D. D is not the same as A, but D has caused B and C to disappear. But what you can also happen is that A can give species B and species C, but C does not mate with species B, but species B does mate with species C. So the genetic information is only, is only exchanged from one parent species to the other. But what you can also happen is that B and C over time, what happens from here is that maybe the stable hybrid zone eventually the hybrids no longer mate with the parents and then it creates a completely new species, which is species D. So see, so these are the four different ways in which natural hybridization can actually impact speciation. And this is quite important because we want to know what happens in, in anthropogenically complicated landscapes. For example, in Borneo, where you have palm oil, logging, mining, and it's forcing many species together, our, is the hybridization that we are observing in central Borneo is could it lead to a new species? Or is the hybrid actually in a stable hybrid zone? Or what is actually happening? But hybridization can also be negative. For example, it can also lead to the extinction of a species. For example, extinction of B. So when B and C, they never had contact with each other. And now all of a sudden, 
because of degradation. They're being pushed towards each other. And this leads to this leads to genetic integration. So where, where they exchange genetic material, but it's actually not even helpful for the species. And as a result, it extincts, it goes extinct. And so hybridization is not always, cannot always, is not always uh, beneficial to primate diversity. So why was I interested in, in this topic? That's because genetic analysis is the only way to actually confirm hybridization. And the cool thing about genetic analysis is that you can just sample water, you can sample air, or you can just take the saliva tissue, which is called eDNA. And you can basically understand from a sample of water, what are the species composition present in the water. But for gibbons, which are, which are very hard to see, which live very high in the rainforest, and you can only hear them, how are we supposed to collect actually genetic samples? It's very hard, but, but they are very loud. So that's why I was thinking, would it be possible to look at vocal structure as opposed to genetic samples? So an example, Mark Viria in 2022, she collected genetic samples of gibbons. It took her 24 months, nearly two years to collect 52 samples. So imagine if we had to do that for each and every gibbon study, um, yeah, we probably will not be where we are today. So therefore, what I was curious about is that, is there another approach? Could gibbon vocal behavior be, yeah, could it maybe provide similar or preliminary insights into genetics? Although that would have to be genetically substantiated, but I was curious, can, yeah, can vocal behavior actually tell me about species composition or can vocal behavior tell me about structural variability? And therefore I used acoustic analysis. So acoustic analysis of gibbons is very important. And, it, and many studies in the past have actually shown that gibbons have identity. They have specific habitat preferences. They are very specific in their distribution. And they have been used for many other studies, such as species composition, and even to basically indicate whether hybridization is taking place. So there are four genera of gibbons. You have the hylobatus, the hulock, the nomascus, and the cephalangus. Now in Borneo, you only have the genera, you only have the genus hylobatus. And there are nine species, but Borneo only has four species. And my interest was mostly in the bottom two, as I explained earlier. And this the hybrid which we know very little about was discovered in 1979 and it is a cross between the white bearded gibbon and the mullery gibbon and the only other study that was ever conducted on this population was in 1992 so which is almost 24 years ago so to understand basically what my study is i will basically briefly explain what is gibbon songs so as you can see over here that each song of a gibbon which is, this is the great call, which is only sung by the female, has four phases. It has the introductory phase, which is in blue. It has the inflective phase where the notes start increasing in frequency and in tempo, which is in orange. It also has a climax phase, which is the highest frequency phase, which is in green. And then slowly the voice goes down, which is called the post-climax phase. And in gibbons, the male and the female, they sing this together. So what you see at the end over here is basically the male part, but the male part has no pattern. It's just very random and it's very variable. It changes each time the male sings it. <coughs> and they sing this early morning and they're constantly duetting with each other. So they alternate. So the male and fem female sing to, to each other. But the great call, what you see over here, which is different for every species, is very genetically conserved. When I say genetically conserved, I basically mean that if you look at a given population 20 years down the line, if you look at a given population 40 years down the line, if you look at a given population 100 years down the line, this great call structure will probably be almost identical to what it is currently in 2023. And that's why it seems the most ideal location to look for species composition, species differences, variability, because they're all genetically expressed. So the great call, it's evolutionary embedded. So it is based on evolution. It is there and it, and it remains stable and constant over time, but it's also stereotypical. With stereotypical, I mean that the pattern and structure in species A is the same irrespective of where the population is. So, for the Muller's gibbon in Borneo, 
it will have the same structure of call as the mullahs given in Sumatra, for example, or in Malaysia. So it's exactly the same thing. It's species specific. So each species have, has a different call and has a different structure. And therefore it's ideal to look for species specific differences. And, but irrespective of it being genetically, for example, genetically conserved, there is also variability. So <laughs> I have a twin brother. We are 99% identical, but we're still very different as people. So although, although genetically expressed, we are 99% identical, we are very different people. So as a result, even with vocalizations that are genetically conserved, there's also a lot of variability. And they have found out that this duetting, which is where the male and female sing together, which I will show you in the next slide. I uh, Hopefully it works. Uh, it has been shown to advertise territoriality. It has been shown to strengthen the, the, the mating and the family bonds between, between children and parents and between mother and father. But it is also used to identify, okay, if you have a mother and father and they produce a child, it is also used to identify if the child moves out of home. Okay, where is my child? Can I hear my child? But it's all, So it has many different functions. So this is just a very simple category of the vocalizations um, I found in my research. And the top one is basically of the white bearded gibbon, which you saw on the left side of the graph. The middle one is the vocalization of the right side of the graph. And the middle one is one variation of the hybrid given. I hope you can hear it. Just let me know if you can hear the sound. So what you heard at the end was actually the male, which it took a bit of time. I think he was a bit sleepy because this was at four o'clock in the morning. So it took him a bit of time, but he eventually, he eventually sung a bit. But so basically, so this sound, it's, uh, yeah, you can imagine how this sounds at four in the morning. It's, uh, it's a very beautiful sound. And now I'll show you what it sounds like for the Muleri. Yeah, so you can already say from just hearing it, there are two main differences. One is that it's a lot faster and it's a lot quicker, the notes. And two, you can see that in this one, you could hear actually the male and female singing together. So they don't always sing, but they can sing. And now I'll show you the hybrid. It sounds a lot like the two parent species, but if you see here, this part over here, with where I'm showing with my mouse, this part is very different. You can see over here that this has five notes, whereas over here it only has two notes. And over here, this has, I think, 20 notes, and here it's only five notes. So this is the most critical part. Yeah, so this one was a bit further away. That's why the sound is a bit lower. But you can clearly see that the 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 duration of the rest intervals between the notes is far slower. And this is just one variation. And I will come back to this a bit in the results. So how did I actually conduct this research? So I used this software called Raven, uh, which was sponsored by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And the platform looks a bit like this. So you see over here that this is called the spectrogram, where you have the hertz which is basically what I spoke about in the first, is one of the characteristics of sound. Each sound has a level of hertz, and it also has time. So you're basically, we're looking at hertz versus time, and this is a gibbon call. It's a hybrid gibbon, and you can see that the gibbon call is very different. It goes up 
comes down, goes up, and goes down again. And what I did is that I tried describing this call that you see here, irrespective of how different it is. I tried I tried describing it using 14 quantitative parameters, which was basically spectral parameters, which basically look at the spreading of the sound, which is basically focused on the Hertz axis, and temporal parameters, which is focusing on the time axis. And I basically used 14 parameters, which eventually got reduced to 10. But you can see that, um, yeah, the grid call has four phases, like I explained before. You have the introductory, the climax, and the post-climax. Uh, introductory is, is very similar to inflective. So I had parameters of duration, which is basically the start of the note till the end of the note. I have parameters of rate, which is the number of notes divided by the duration. So intronotes, rate of emission of intronotes is the number of intronotes, which is one, two, three, four, five, divided by how long it takes for this note until this note to be sung by the given. And then I was looking at variables of rest. I was looking at the interval between the climax notes, which is basically the, the distance between the two boxes here. And you can see I did this manually with my hand and you can understand why it takes around three months to do very little work. So yeah, it's a uh, very tedious. Um, so my research question was uh, determine whether acoustic analysis of given song structure can be used as a tool for species classification, for species discrimination, and to study spatial structural variability in given populations that inhabit a natural hybrid given zone. With this research question, I had three sub-questions. Can the female grade call, which you just saw, can that be used to discriminate? Can that be used to say which species is which between species that live together? Um, how does a landscape that is characterized by rivers, by mountains, how does that influence spatial variability in given song structure? And lastly, uh, what I wanted to know is, can acoustic analysis tell me anything can acoustic analysis of the hybrid tell me anything about yeah tell me anything about the parents of the hybrid so since song structure is genetically expressed i wanted to reverse it and see can song structure tell me anything about the genetics although this would have to be genetically substantiated but it is kind of making an educated and predictive probability guess if you can understand what i'm trying to say so uh, what is unique about my study site? So my study site, which is Barito Ulu, was one out of the three natural hybrid zones in all of Southeast Asia. So the entire Southeast Asia, there are only three zones. One is in Thailand, one is in Malaysia, West Malaysia, and one is in Central Borneo, um, which is very unique, but there's only been one study that has been done. And that's why I was a bit like, oh, that's a bit weird or a bit surprised. So I was like, okay, let's focus on the given population in Borneo. It's the only hybrid zone in the whole of Borneo. Uh, yeah, it's the only hybrid zone in the whole of Borneo where the distributional ranges between two species, the white bearded gibbon and the Muller's gibbon, the albibarbus and the Mulleri, where they overlap. And it is the only known case of natural hybridization between gibbon subspecies. There is no other known case in Borneo where this has happened under natural circumstances. And this is also not caused by fragmentation. It's not caused by mining. It's not caused by logging. It just happened. And the hybrid population is very locally distributed. It is found nowhere else besides 3,500 square kilometers in the middle of Borneo. So my study site. Uh, so you can see my study site was around 8,000 hectares. And the elevation changed from 0 to 550 meters. So the red is basically slope. It shows you how steep is the mountain. So you, 90 degrees is like this. So 60 degrees is very steep, if you can understand. So um, yeah, although the elevation is only between zero to 550 meters, if you're walking up a slope with 60 degrees, yeah, it takes a bit of time. Um, I had 18 locations, which was basically six locations times three, because each location was made up of three listening posts, which you saw in triangulation. This was mostly done for triangulation. So each array had three listening posts and I had six look and I had six locations like this. So the distance between this array and this array was 10 kilometers. And the distance between 
this 1A and 4A was around 1.5. Now, um, yeah, so the landscape is mostly primary diptrocarp rainforest. And all this area that you see now is already given to palm oil and logging concessions. So if they wanted to come tomorrow and take away the coal, it's basically gone. So what were the methods I used? Like I showed before, I used passive, active, and I used strangulation. So this is passive bioacoustics where I installed the monitors on trees. This is active bioacoustics. What you see in the right top and the bottom left is basically active, um, yeah, active bioacoustics. So I'm actually actively recording the calls of where they're coming from because I only wanted to record the great call. And this is triangulation where you can see that they're taking the compass and they're noting down the time of call. Okay, so to go into the results. Um, so I used... Um, I used uh, three different analytical techniques, which I've not gone into detail because it's not really important. But um, but this, this is basically the result. This is all based on structural parameters. So you can see very clearly over here. So in order to know if there's a hybrid, you first need to know, is it true that there are two parent species? And if the two parent species are there, um, are they actually different based on the vocal characteristics they hear? That you can hear. And you can see very clearly that red is mullery and blue is albibarbus, you can see that they don't even touch each other except for one point that was misclassified. They don't touch each other. So you can see that the characteristics that belong to one parent are very distinct and they're indeed very different than the characteristics, vocal characteristics of the other parent. So what I did was I, I did a dimension reduction analysis where you basically look at all the parameters together and the algorithm then pushes the parameters in only two dimensional space, which is the Y axis and the X axis. But I wanted to know, um, can I, can the data tell me how many clusters there are? And this I used using hierarchical cluster analysis, which I used below. And you can see very clearly that on the left, you have Mulleri, which is the red. And on the right, you have Albibarbus, which is blue. So you see that this image and this image say the same thing, but in a slightly different way. Now, this image basically, it's correct, but you have other analytical techniques which are a bit more specific and they're a bit more precise. So I wanted to cross check or cross validate. Is it true that I have only two parent species or are there actually more? So I run additional techniques and you can actually see that you have two clusters and you have two clusters, which basically indicates that the data in on its own is conveying to me that there are actually two clusters and only two clusters, which basically is albibarbus and mullery. So we know now that the parent species are present and that they're very different based on song characteristics. So what is interesting is that albibarbus and mullery I'll be Barbus on the top and Mullery at the bottom. They are two different species, but they are genetically, if you look at the entire genome, they're quite similar. So they are different, but they are not very, yeah, they are different, but they are not very different. So if you compare two different halobeta species, like the Abbots gibbon and the Northern Bornean gibbon, they are far more genetically different than these two gibbons. But what is interesting, is that acoustic analysis can still discriminate between gibbons. And you would imagine if gibbons are genetically similar, they must have genetically similar calls. But acoustic analysis is sensitive enough to basically even distinguish between calls of genetically similar species, which is actually very interesting. The other thing that you see is that this axis on the left from zero to one basically shows you dissimilarity. It basically shows you how different is this cluster from this cluster. And what you see, so this distance here is the, is the variation between species. And this distance here, the clusters that you see at the bottom is the variation within a species. And you can see that the two species are definitely more different than the differences within the same species. I hope it's clear. If there are any other questions, if there if there are any questions, uh, Pa, just uh, let me know. 
but um, yeah, so basically, and um, to try to break this down in very simple terms, there are two species, Halobates albibarbus and Halobates mulleri. So now that we have supported or found evidence that song structure can actually discriminate between two species, the question is, is there a hybrid species? And this is what you can see over here. You can see that on the left, which is basically the mulleri, and on the right, which is basically the albibarbus, which is basically here, left mulleri and right albibarbus, you can see that you have almost like this green cloud that is floating in between. Now this green cloud, which is each single point is basically a vocal characteristic data. You clearly see that in between the two parent species, you have song structures that are actually in between the two parents. And this actually shows that you actually have hybrid vocalizations. You actually have the presence of vocal song structure that is very different than from the two parent species. And that was the last recording that I that I that I made you listen to. So again, if you do a cluster analysis, you can again see that on the left you have Mulleri, and on the right you have Albibarbus, red and blue. But what you what is interesting is that you can see that the green occurs across the entire gradient. So when you go from left to right, the hybrid structure of song resembles more one parent on the left side and it resembles more the other parent on the right side and it resembles both parents in the middle so this cluster in between the in between the red and in between the blue actually the structure of the song of that hybrid vocalization and therefore individual resembles both parents left and right pretty equally but this cluster all the way on the right is very strongly similar to albibarbus whereas this cluster on the left the structure of the song is very similar to Mulleri. Again, I carried out additional statistic analysis to really make sure whether what this analysis showing is correct. And you do and you do see that indeed there are only two there are only two clusters, which is one parent and the other parent, and you have two clusters here, which is one parent and the other parent. Now you may ask yourself, well, if I'm seeing three types of vocalizations, why don't I have three clusters? If you remember in the beginning, I showed you the different evolutionary mechanisms of hybridization. You see that in the first one, you see that two parents, when they back cross with the hybrids, they don't, the hybrid itself does not create a new species, but instead it back crosses. So you get almost like this matrix, you get like this gradient, which is basically what you see here. So we can all, we can say based on song at least, although this would have to be genetically supported, that based on song structure, that we don't have a new species or a third species, but we definitely have a species that that back crosses or that mates with the parents. Now I was also curious. Okay, if I have the hybrid population, how many different types of vocalizations do I see in the hybrid population? And you can, clear very, you can see very clearly here that there are three main vocalizations. Vocalization one in red, vocalization blue, that is cluster two, and green. And one of the vocalizations I showed you is from one of these clusters. Which one this is, I don't know. But it's interesting to see that you see three clusters and three types of vocalization. So although the parent species have only one vocalization, the hybrid has three vocalizations. So um, to make things a bit more complicated, I was also curious to see, okay, I have 10 structural parameters. I wanted to know which parameter could predict the great call structure the best. In other, in other words, if I have, I was looking at a hybrid zone with two parent species and a hybrid species. I wanted to know if I have no idea what species is what, are there any structural parameters that can predict in advance that can predict, okay, how many species are there? So what you can see over here on the top left is that you can see that if you, if, if you only look at the albibarbus and you only look at the mulleri, you see that the post-climax phase, which was the last phase of the call, is actually the most important predictor. And that makes sense because the main difference between albibarbus and mulleri is that you don't, the albibarbus does not have that last phase of call. So this makes sense. But I was curious if I put all the species together, say I put all the vocal parameters together, what do I see? 
And you can see that the duration of the climax trill phase, so that is the duration of the highest frequency notes and the rest intervals between the high frequency notes, that these two parameters alone, if you build a model and you train the model, these two parameters alone can tell you how many species of what, how many individuals of what species are actually there in a population, which is very interesting because that's what we're actually curious about. We're, we're, we're trying to see, can we actually automate this process? We don't want to keep doing this manually. We want to automate it. And you can see that based on the model that the accuracy with which this algorithm is able to predict calls is almost 100% accurate for the two parent species. And that it's almost 86% accurate if you're looking at all the species together. So in other words, this model is already very accurate. If you train it more, it will become even more better. The other interesting thing that we see here is that temporal variables, so parameters of time, such as duration, are better than spectral parameters. So parameters of time are better than parameters of, of frequency. So there's no point focusing on frequency parameters because they don't tell too much about how different the species are. But if you look at temporal variables, they tell you far more about the species. So parameters of time, which basically look at duration. So how many seconds of notes or how long does a great call take to be produced? Basically tells you a lot more than spectral variables. But then if you look into temporal variables, what's also interesting is that variables of duration, such as, so duration is, if, if, I, if I go from point A to point B, how long does that take me? That is far better than looking at duration than variables of rate. So it's far better than looking at the number of nodes per second, which is also very interesting. So there's, although temporal variables are better than spectral variables, there is also a classification within that. Now, I was, I was also curious, what is, is there geographic variability across space? And what you see over here, uh, these are the arrays which I had, 1A, 2A, 3A, 4A, 5A, 6A. You can see that there is a, there is a big variation and the variation is more pronounced for the Muller given. So you see that from location 1AB to location 3AB, the color changes very, very dramatically. It goes from almost orange to purple. And this color difference basically basically tells me that if this is orange and this is 25% orange, that means it's 75% purple. And if this is 90% purple, that means it's only 5% yellow. So it basically shows you how different the song structure is across space. And we can see that for the parent species that the Muller gibbon shows more variability than actually the Albibarbus gibbon, which I really don't know what the reason is. Now, if you look at the hybrid population, we also see clear differences. We see that the hybrid population changes dramatically from here in terms of song structure. The song is super different at 1ABC as compared to 3ABC. And across the river where you have 4ABC, it's almost orange, whereas at 2ABC, it's almost a mixture of orange and purple. So we see a lot of variability in song structure. And yeah, so this is very interesting. Now, the last thing of the results is basically the genetics. And that is basically, although I did not do any genetic analysis, I was wondering, can song structure tell me anything about the, about potentially about the genetic makeup of the parents? And what you see over here is that on the y-axis and left and on the y and x-axis, you have the geographic coordinates of the listening posts. And this, the A, this color scheme over here is basically tells you this. So basically it tells you this. If you have color purple, for example, this point over here, it tells you that it's almost 100%. The structure of the call is almost 100% that of H. albibarbus. If you have a point that is yellow, it tells you that the structure of the call is almost 100% Mullery. So what we did here is that we used the model and we trained an algorithm on it and we made the algorithm predict the hybrid song structure with respect to the parents. 
And what you see over here is as you go from as you go from location 1A to location 3A, there's a dramatic change in the in the predicted parental contributions to song structure. So over here, song structure is mostly I'll be barbus. As you go five kilometers down the river, it becomes almost half I'll be barbus, half mullery. And when you go further down, it becomes almost completely mullery. So we see that across space, the the parents, the population of parents is changing. And this is resulting in variations of basically hybrid song structure. And the song structure that we saw, we saw three variations, is likely, could be because of this. And what is also interesting is that you see that the line changes dramatically. It goes from, so this is the mean. So I all these points together, I took the average. And I said, okay, what is the average that it is parent one? And what is the average that it is parent two? And you see that it goes from almost 0 0.9 being parent albibarbus. This changes across five kilometers to being 0.7% albibarbus. And then it dramatically falls down to just being 0.2% albibarbus, which basically means that it's 0.8%. It's 80% basically mullery. Um, and the main difference as to why we don't have any yellow color over here is because of the river. So we see that the river actually prevents high, uh, it prevents hylobates mullery from coming down the river, and therefore we don't see any yellow color on the on the on the south on the south side of the river. So to wrap up uh, my research, um, yeah, I hope it's understandable. Um, it is not too easy to always break it down in simple terms, uh, just using a few presentation slides. But so what is the cons conservation implications of this research? Firstly, Borneo is it's a very it's a it's part of the Sundaland biodiversity hotspot and it has a lot of endemic fauna. Secondly, it's the first time that this hybrid population, that this given hybrid population is being put on the map. Although previously there was a research, it's not publicly available. So this will be the first time that this research will be publicly available and that people will know that there's a hybrid population. It's also the first time that auditory data collected can be used for long-term monitoring. Before, auditory data was collected on cassette tapes, but these tapes you don't use anymore. So this is the first time that we actually have auditory data. It's the second study ever conducted since the discovery of this population. Uh, first one was in 1992, and the second one is in 2024. So, which is also interesting that there's a large gap that we actually don't know about. How did variability in population change? We don't know that. Thirdly, it improves our understanding on how natural hybridization occurs in natural hybrid given zones. It shows us that natural hybridization impacts song structure, and that across space, there is definitely a difference. But it also shows that, that if you have rivers and mountains, that, that song structure can also tell you where is there limitation for individuals to disperse. Three, uh, we show actually here that given great call vocal structure is a very robust monitoring tool for given ecology and conservation. Uh, we also show that, so we wanted to actually develop bioacoustics as a reliable tool to survey and monitor gibbons. And how we did this is that we actually broke down the great call into parameters. So this is one way of quantitatively basically tackling this problem of trying to automate Gibbon acoustic analysis. And lastly, this research was not done by myself. There were a lot of people from Murung Raya that helped me with this research. So it also contributed them to giving a different source of income and to helping them learn a new skill and technique for future research. And um, yeah, now to wrap off um, this research, I have created a very short video that will give you a better idea of what it looked like in the field. Shall I play it, Pa? Yes, please. Okay.
Okay, so just to end the presentation, I just want to thank uh, Universitas Kajimada and uh, especially Dr. Muhammad Ali Imran for this amazing opportunity. I think uh, it was a very interesting research. It was, um, yeah, it's a bit sometimes a bit complicated to break it down. But um, yeah, and of course, I want to thank um, my team, Bang Amat, Bang Unil, Bang Aziz, Bang Henry, uh, Alan and Mas Ebri. I would like to also especially thank uh, Christian Moreau uh, because she actually lent out uh, passive acoustic monitors and there are a lot of uh, funders that have contributed to financially supporting this research. So a big thanks for that. And uh, yeah, if there are any questions from uh, from students that would like to contact me for any particular reason, yeah, feel free to follow me on Instagram. You can also, um, yeah, you can also message me via Instagram. And um, I have some emails where you can also... Um, yeah, email me through. And if you have LinkedIn, then uh, that's also possible. And uh, yeah, if there are any questions, uh, please. Thanks, Yurian. Applause for Yurian. Yeah, thank wow. you. Grand, grand, grand. So I didn't expect that you you trying to uh, combine with the genetic uh, 
and I said, so that was really amazing. So I would like to invite uh, participant to ask question. Uh, this is very interesting research project and also Julian gave us some basic background on bioacoustic and then the uh, application of uh, bioacoustic study. So we, we say it current. Okay, please. Uh, anybody would like to ask, you may raise your hand and then Rizky, uh, Rizky Kurnia Tohir, please, you you may bisa juga bahasa Indonesia, Yorian pinter bahasa Indonesia, tapi ini tadi saya minta berbahasa uh, Inggris biar kita juga belajar, silakan Rizky. Oke, okay, thank you Pak Imron and Yorian. I am Rizky. I was also participant of Simba 2, Simba in Jogja, and okay. uh, participant of BIT uh, year 2. Interesting presentation to compare to given species and their hybrid from bioacoustics. Uh, I'm working with amphibian, especially bleeding toad, and I am inter interested in the use of triangle, triangle method for amphibian re in river area. Can it be applied to amphibian bioacoustics research in river area, especially for its application to the SECR method? Thank you. Yeah, hi, Risky. Yeah, I remember you from uh, Simba too. Um, yeah, so it's nice to see you. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I think, um, so triangulation, I think, so there are many challenges with triangulation, which I did not discuss, of course. Uh, one of them being is that um, the time at which a frog, for example, in our case, it was a given the time at which a given calls is not always consistent in how individual pairs because each post has two people. So the the time at which they actually record the call is not very accurate. And uh, that can cause complications. The I'm not sure, I don't know too much about frogs, but what I do know is that if you have a river habitat with frogs, I don't think you only have one frog. I think you have many frogs. <laughs> so... If you're trying, to, for example, gibbons, the they have they have a they have a home range size that's around that's around five hundred yeah it's around uh, fifty to one hundred fifty hectares so it's around anywhere between five hundred to one one point five kilometers so the density is actually far less so therefore you can actually use strangulation because they actually have specific areas but I think with frogs it's going to be actually very hard because uh, yeah unless it's a very rare species of frog and and they have a very large a uh, home range size and therefore there's a lot of uh, fighting between males and therefore the distance between males is very big i don't think triangulation can actually be used for frogs if that uh, makes sense okay thank you yeah thanks Risky. any buddy ask question please or give comment Suan yes, please. Can you open your mic? Um, hi, can you hear me? Yes, please. Uh, yeah, yes, I just yes. want to ask a bit about the infrasonic sound as I'm um, annotating for um, elephants. Like, how do you like observe the rumbling sound in this Raven Pro software as this, like, it's hard to detect it? So, so you're asking how you can actually, uh, how you can actually see infrasonic sound? Yeah, because you mentioned that it's lower frequency, right? You cannot be detected by usual he hearing by people. Um. Yeah. I actually. I mean. Um. I've I have I've he I have heard elephant rumbles, but they are they're not the infrasonic rumble. It's more the like the human hear rumble, but. Uh, you actually have special equipment, like you also have for bats. You have special equipment that can actually record the same spectrogram, so you can actually see the notes of the bat. Um, um, I mean, bats don't really have notes, but you can hear the squeaks um, actually using special equipment. So you actually have special equipment also for infrasonic sounds, like for elephants. So it is possible to actually see it, but uh, like like a rumble is just it's a it's very close going. It just it's just a rumble of noise. So it won't be as clear as what you see for a gibbon, but it's definitely possible to actually see it on a graph. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yurian, I have a team who work also on elephant acoustic 
so I would like to invite mm-hmm. Giot or uh, Nabil to explain their experience on uh, detecting rumbles. Yes, Giot? please. I will just stop uh, sharing my screen. Yes. Giot or Nabil, can you explain a bit? Shanli, do you speak Bahasa or not? Uh, I'm from Malaysia, so I'm not really sure about Bahasa Indonesia. But I can speak. I can understand Bahasa uh, uh, if it's a bit more simple. Okay, so I, I invite uh, Kiot or Nabil. I can help you to translate if you like to speak in Bahasa. Oh, uh, hello. Yes, hello, please, Kiot. Yes, very uh, simple. Agak dekat dia, agak suaranya masih jauh. Yeah, I'm sorry. Can you hear my voice right now? Yeah, yeah. good. Yes. Lebih jelas. <laughs> okay, thank you for the questions, Swanli. Yeah, your name is Swanli, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, uh, our thesis. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, my undergraduate thesis is about vocalizations of uh Sumatran elephants, uh, in Taman Nasional Gunung Leuser or Gunung Leuser National Park. Tangkan Resort. So first time we must uh, hear everything of the elephant Sumatran sounds. So we must uh, check one one by one of the Sumatran elephants from the Sri Lanka and from Africa from the website of Elephant Voices and another uh, source. So first time uh, is it, that is the first step. And the second step is we. Uh, we follow the Sumatran elephants at the forest. So we must know what is the rumbles, what is the roars, what is the uh, trumpets. So uh, uh, after that, we check at the Raven Pro and that is maybe uh, below 20 Hertz, but we can see it uh, like uh, many, many strips, yeah, many strips, uh, the black strips. And we can uh, do, yeah. We can different it with uh, another uh, sounds. Yeah. Can you yes. uh, know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. 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 Thanks, Kiot. Uh, suddenly, it's, so yeah, you can uh, discuss with Kiot or Nabil later on uh, about this, and. Thanks for the question. We have also Nabil. Actually, I would like to invite Nabil to answer it, but he asked it. So, please, <laughs> Nabil. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, maybe I want to add uh, a little information about the Rumble Sonic Force. So, okay. uh, yeah, for Swani, uh, maybe you can, uh, the first is you can more deeply know about the characteristic of the rumble sound because uh, the rumble sound has a uh, very unique the uh, the pattern of the spectrogram so if you just focus in uh, the lowest frequencies uh, maybe above uh, 306 360 hertz Mm-hmm. And uh yeah, you just focus to analysis in that frequencies and you know the form of the spectrogram and because this uh, rumble has a unique spectrogram and may- maybe you can more uh easy easy to find the rumbles or yeah just it or the situation. And- yeah, thanks. Thank yeah, yeah. And also, what is your question? Yeah, for, for my question, uh, I want to ask about the triangulation approach. So, uh, is the triangulation approach influenced by sound traveling? Uh, I mean, like, how about when we do that experiments in the slope, or maybe we have a uh, Hike, hike or low slope and is it uh, has an effect on the result the triangulation result I mean 
and is it possible to mm. be applied to terrestrial species, for example, the elephants that have uh, infrasound sounds, especially? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for your question. Even I had a question, actually. Um, do elephants actually have different rumbles? Like, is it species specific for elephants as well? Or, or between individuals? Do you know if the rumble is different? Not yet clear, I think. We didn't okay. have yet. Uh, but in the future, we expect that we, we are going to the direction, but we didn't have a chance to analyze. But I'm not really sure uh, with other species, other uh, elephant species. Okay. Yeah. But uh, coming to the question, Pasti, Kalawada Tbing, Swara Kahilangan. So, yes, um, it is definitely affected by sound. Um, for gibbons, the sound is around 800 meters to one kilometer. And I think for rumbles, they're far more longer. Like, I think it's easily one to two kilometers. And that will also the distance of a rumble will also affect where the listening post locations are. But for gibbons, they're around 400 to 600 meters because the sound does not travel too far. But yes, for sure. If you do it, uh, elephants, if you do them in savanna landscape and you compare that to um, forest landscape, oh yeah, the rumbles are going to be very different in, in terms of how far they can actually travel. So yes, it is definitely affected by topography uh, very heavily. Actually, one of the main drawbacks that I noticed with triangulation in central Borneo was there's a lot of echoing taking place because of mm. yeah, because there's a lot of yeah so there's a lot of echoing taking place. So you actually feel like you're hearing something coming from the north, but it's actually just a reflection. It's just an echo of the sound coming from the south. So you may think that two different groups, but it's actually the same group. So, but uh, yeah, I don't know too much about how elephant noise travels on the ground. So I'm not sure uh, how that would be affected with topography, but I know for gibbons because it's actually produced in the air that it's definitely affected by by uh, habitat, distance, weather. If it rains or if it's uh, cloudy or if it's not raining, it's uh, all these things affect uh, uh, distance propagation. Yeah. Yuriana also Nabil for the discussion. Really nice to have uh, many different uh, sources of information. Animals, yeah, so, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Any more question for Yurian? Uh, yes, sir. Dr. please. Yeah. Um. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so when you did the um. Uh, active uh, acoustic sampling. Did you also do the visual observation to uh, to to identify the species, or you did basically just mainly from the calls? Yeah, I only did it from the calls because you can you actually I think in three months that I was there, I think I saw a gibbon only twice, so they are quite hard to see. So if you're if you're basically waiting to see a gibbon, yeah, I think you'll be. <laughs> You'll have a longer research than if you're doing genetic sampling. <laughs> so, yeah, I think it's a lot longer. Yeah, so no, I only did it through song structure. And that's why I was curious to see if song structure would work because I can't see them, but I can hear them. And I can hear them a lot and I can hear them from very far distances. So I was also curious if sounds, if song structure can actually tell me anything about hybrids. But also with, uh, but also with fur pattern, hybrids, they have different colors for sure. But it's hard to say if you see if you see say light brown, dark brown, light gray, like what kind of hybrid is that? So I think song structure could actually be uh, maybe a better predictor. Yeah. Good. Okay, thank you. Kiyot, please. Again for the. Okay, right now yeah. you can hear. Yeah. 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 Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the for the sound. Okay. Uh, no first, uh, that this is the very interest research because this is my first time to know the sound can uh, can can help us to know about the genetic of the hyalobates. Uh, yeah. 
Okay. So my first, so my question is about the point of the of your method. So how did you find the point to installing your device and your triangulation methods? Because I know you don't explain it uh, at the before your before presentation. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No. Thanks for your question. Maybe just to clarify, song structure. Like song structure can't say anything about genetics because I've not mm -hmm. done any genetic analysis. But what I'm doing is that I'm I'm saying since genetic analysis determines song structure, can we do the reverse analysis and say, can song structure determine something about genetics? But in order to know that, you'll actually have to do a genetic study. But mm -hmm. the reason why I did that is that other genetic studies have actually shown that song structure can actually tell you it can. Uh, song structure can actually distinguish between species. And that's why I use that study uh, with an educated prediction saying this could potentially be possible. But actually, if any of you are interested to do a genetic an analysis on gibbons in central Borneo, uh, yeah, please do contact me and find Ron because, uh, yeah, I would be that's very easy. actually uh, to actually do a genetic analysis to basically confirm if what I'm doing is actually, does that make sense? And if anyone else wants to continue this research, uh, yeah, please just uh, contact me. Con um, I'm also in touch with Paimron, and then we can really talk about a very interesting opportunity. But uh, how I determined locations, uh, what I did was I basically used a GIS. Do you know what GIS is? Yes, it's common for Yeah, go ahead. so I basically used a GIS software, and I basically overlaid different layers. So I used topography, and I basically looked at, okay, I wanted to put the locations higher because the higher they are, I could uh, maybe listen to Gibbons from a bit more of a distance. And so that's how basically I eventually established it. And then what I did is when I went to the location, I actually walked each and every location one time before I did the survey to just confirm if the locations were actually correctly placed or not. But uh, mm -hmm. I basically determined them using GIS. And I basically, um, it was just a random in the sense that I wanted to have a grid and I basically put just one and a half kilometers in between it from left, to north, south, east, west, the distance between one, one sample, uh, one listening post and the other listening post or three or the array and one array had to just be a max, a minimum distance of one and a half kilometers. That's the only criteria I actually used because after one and a half kilometers, you can't hear the given call at all. So that was the only criteria I used to basically determine uh, the locations of the listening post. And I did the same thing for triangulation. For triangulation, they have to be anywhere between 400 to 600. And again, I established each location at a high altitude uh, location so that they could hear each other. That was the only thing I did. But uh, I used basically GIS. That's the easiest way to do it. Great. Thanks. Uh, the last one is Noor Sanya. Uh... You may ask directly, Nursania. Or, yeah, Hi, Yurian. Uh, hello. Okay, Nursania, yeah, please. Uh, hi, Jorian. Thanks for uh, the amazing uh, reset. Uh, uh, we do the research for the uh, Gibbon and Siamang in Lauser National Park uh, with uh, fixed point count method, uh, triangulation. And uh, we do uh, pa uh, passive acoustic monitoring, uh, but uh, the passive acoustic monitoring uh, just for check uh, present and absent. Uh, the purpose, uh, we do the research for uh, estimate uh, the population given in Siamang in Lausar. Uh, I want to ask to you, uh, can uh, passive acoustic monitoring uh, for estimate the population too um like you can estimate you can estimate population once you know density and you're yes. getting density from triangulation yes. so if you get density from triangulation you can probably make an estimate on population um so i don't think you really need to use passive acoustic monitors but if you're interested in using passive acoustic monitors um uh, i don't know if you have my email but maybe just send me an email and then i can send you some i can send you some uh some literature paper that I found that that shows that potentially it is possible to do use passive acoustic monitors to also estimate density. 
but it's a bit more complicated because the the dist the reason why I used active acoustics is because they're very directional, but uh, passive acoustics they're omnidirectional, so they take sound out of every from every direction. So if you have a sound coming from north, how are you supposed to know where the sound is coming from? So that's the only problem with yes. using passive acoustics. You can't know where the, where the sound is exactly coming yes. from, and because you can't do that, you can't estimate if the calling group is coming from the north, south, mm -hmm. east, or west. So you don't even know the density of the group. So I think that's the main challenge with passive acoustic monitors. But there is a there is a paper that has actually done it. So if you're interested, uh, yeah, please do send me an email and I will send you that uh, paper and then we can always uh, further discuss it and explore it together. Okay, thanks. Uh, I will send you email. <laughs> yes, terima kasih juga. Uh, thank you. Yeah, terima kasih. Terima kasih, Pak Imran. Ya, terima kasih juga. Saya kira... Uh, keren sekali, sekali lagi kita kasih aplaus untuk Yorian.